don't feel like praying. Has anybody ever been in a situation where you just didn't feel like praying? Yeah. And I'm not talking about lacking the discipline of prayer. I'm talking about there simply not being in you the words to say that would express where you were at in life. And uh, that's a unique situation. And uh, I continue to work through some material that I'm also using in another setting where that I'm talking about uh, depression, surviving and overcoming, and where is God in my dark place. Whenever people talk about what they go through in seasons of depression, they talk about the sense of exhaustion. They talk about no enthusiasm for anything, even the things that have been most enjoyed in their life. Uh, they talk about it's hard to breathe. I would like to just crawl under the bed and just go away. And a friend of mine was listening to a Christian talk show sometime back. <coughs> Someone called into that show, was struggling with depression, and uh, they expressed to uh, the uh, host and the guest what was going on in their lives and much to my friend's dismay, the host and the guests derided them and suggested that what they needed was a real good praying through. And that if they would just pray more, that they wouldn't be feeling the things that they're feeling. It made my friend angry. He's dealt with some of those things in life. And now, now, I would be a fool, any person would be a fool to denigrate prayer in any way. Prayer is our relationship. Prayer is our communication with God. I'm part of a praying church, and we will continue to be a praying church. Our prayers will not diminish. Our prayers will increase because that needs to be our identity. It's the way we're going to affect and impact the world around us. Well, we go through seasons of life. Life is a land of hills and valleys. And there are certainly times when people go through times of oppression and depression. And what they are going through has a spiritual foundation. But that's not always the case. It's not always connected with guilt. It's not always connected with shame. It's not always connected with the thought that someone is backslidden, and if they could just get their hearts right with God, that everything would be okay. Well, in those instances where that the issue is not spiritual, prayer in and of itself is not necessarily the cure to what a person is going through. It may be that someone would say, well, you need to go on an extended fast. Well, fasting is a positive aspect of Christian life because it brings our bodies under discipline and things that we used to fret about suddenly become really unimportant when you're hungry enough. But it's not simply that you can pray your way through or that you can fast your way through some difficult times. And so I want to talk to you initially about a mature understanding of prayer. And it is this, that having an effective prayer life is not based on a feeling. You see, prayer that is based on feeling is dependent on our emotion. And so we pray while the emotions move us to pray. But when we do not feel the emotions, we don't pray. Well, I feel like going to prayer meeting. Well, there's times when you more often than not, perhaps, when you don't feel like going to prayer meeting. Well, I need to go to church 30 minutes early for prayer. Pastor calls us to do that. Well, I don't feel like that. And if we're going to base our prayer life for our investment in corporate prayer on how we feel, the truth of the matter is that we're not going to pray very often, nor are we going to pray very much. So here we are. We're going through a difficult time. 
You're dealing with depression. You're dealing with grief. You're dealing with anxiety. You're dealing with whatever despair may have come your life. And, and so because your prayer life is based on how you feel, you stop praying. But that is an immature understanding of prayer because Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount and he said it three times when you pray. Three times in a single paragraph when you pray. It was not if you pray, but it was when you pray. It seems that Jesus expected those who followed him to be people who were people of prayer. Prayer is not an optional aspect of Christian life. It is not something we do while we're on fire for God. It's not something that we just do while we're having great personal revival. You pray when you feel bad. You pray when you feel good. You pray when there's grief. You pray when there's happiness. You pray on the mountain. You pray in the valley. You pray on the good times. You pray in the bad times. When you pray. But in seasons of depression and in seasons of oppression. It may well be that the approaches we take to prayer do not work as well as some alternative approaches. I fought this particular battle. I walked through this road and I know some things that have helped me to be effective to continue to pray when I did not feel like praying. And it wasn't that I missed the importance of prayer. Understanding, logic, and thinking has nothing to do with your emotions. You know it in your head, but getting it done with your actions, your heart, your emotions, stand in the way of it. And you kneel to pray, and I've done this many, many times. I have tried my best to pray. And there simply was not a word there. There simply was no way for me to express what I had to say. It was as though my mind was somehow numb. And I could not find the phrase. I could not capture the right sense. I was left with no words for God. I knew that I needed to have words for God. I knew that I needed to have a conversation with God. But I simply did not know what to say, nor did I have the energy to dig out those words. But prayer is an aspect of Christian life that needs to happen when you have the words or when you don't have the words. And so my best solution, and it's one that I've shared with hundreds if not thousands of people all over the world, is to use the book of Psalms as a prayer book. Now, in the liturgical religious world, they use the book of Psalms at times in exactly this manner. And many of them, they will have something that is known as a prayer book. And you can simply just read aloud a particular prayer. But here's what helped me. Maybe this will help you. And it was that I would read the Psalms different than I ever had. You see, almost all of my Bible reading through the years has been silent reading. I just read the Word of God. And it flows through my mind. And the truth of the matter is that we've all had the experience of reading the Bible. And we've read two or three chapters. And we realize that we haven't captured a single thing of what we've read. Our eyes have gone over the page. We've looked at the words. But it has not flowed into our mind. I've done that quite often. An author by the name of Eugene Peterson has written any number of books, and I've enjoyed some of them. But he said something interesting about the Psalms. 
He said the Psalms were never written by David and the other psalmists to be read silently. But these were intended to be read aloud. That this was to be verbalized. That this was to be an expression. While I'm reading it silently, particular material just flows under my eyes, but it may not gain any true mental engagement. But something different happens when those same words are read <laughs> aloud. And slowly reading the psalm, reading the words aloud engages the mind. And in this context, now this isn't true of every context, but in this context of reading the Bible in this way, the mouth cannot speak without the brain and the mind being engaged. And so when I begin to read the Psalms in this particular manner and in this fashion, it is only a short time before one of those psalms resonates with my current situation in life. And I begin to feel like, you know what? That's my prayer today. <coughs> David may have writ written that prayer, but today it's my prayer. I'm using his words, but it means something to me. This is what I'm going through right now. And in that moment, the ancient psalm becomes something personal to me. It is my prayer. It is speaking to my situation in life and my relationship with God. And my feelings are being expressed to Him. Alright? You have your Bibles. And if not, we can put it up on the screen. I want you to open your Bible, Psalm chapter 1. And now this is not going to be as effective as it would be if we were doing this by ourselves. But I want to show you. I don't want to just tell you. I want to show you what I'm talking about tonight. So you're there. And it's on the screen. Psalm chapter 1. And we're going to begin with verse 1. Psalm 1 and verse 1. And I want us to read aloud together. And I want us to read slowly together. All right? You with me? Yes. On the screen, got your Bible in your hand. This is the way this works. <laughs> Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now it may well be that I read the first psalm, and it doesn't connect with where I'm at in life at all. But if I have come to God and I am feeling barren, or if I am feeling as though I am excluded or I am missing out on something because I am a follower of God, when I begin to read that I am like a tree planted by the river of water that brings forth fruit in his season, and that my benefit is so much better than the benefit of the ungodly. You see, that begins to say something to me. That begins to talk to me. My life is not quite as bad 
as maybe I thought it was. Let's try it with Psalm, the second Psalm. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Let's start over because I'm not, I'm not sure it was on the screen when I started. So let's start again. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in in him. <coughs> that song spoke to someone sitting in this room, right? The third psalm is a psalm of David when he is fleeing from Absalom, his son, and Absalom has kicked him out of being king of Israel. And this will resonate with some others reading together aloud Psalm 3. Lord, how are they increase that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many of they would say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. See love. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all thy enemies upon the chief bones. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Thy, thy blessing is upon thy people. Sing. Now, we could continue doing that. But if something in a psalm resonates and it speaks to me, I usually will go back and read that psalm a second time. I may read it slower. I want it to marinate my brain. I want to soak in the juices of its truth. I want it to affect me. I want it to impact me. And so I read the psalm and then I may read it for a third time because it's, it's become my prayer. This is no longer David's prayer when he is fleeing from Absalom, his son. Now this is my prayer. This belongs to me at this particular season of my life. Before I was struggling, before I was going through it, before I felt like that I was a man alone in this crisis and I did not have the words to express what I had happened in my life. I simply could not express it. But I came to that psalm and it became me. The prayer became mine. It became words to pray when you don't know how to pray. 
when you don't have words to say. In that moment, when it clicks, there it is. There have been times when this happened, and as I begin to read a song, tears would begin to come. Because this was my story. This was where I was at. I didn't have the words to say it. But the poet had captured it exactly. And so it was something that helped me. They're the right words. I couldn't articulate them. When a person's dealing with depression, one of the things that happens is in the middle processes of the mind, everything slows down. I have an acquaintance who at seasons when I have particularly struggled, he becomes impatient with me. Just spit it out. But it's not that easy. You just can't spit it out because, number one, you can't capture the right thought. And then secondly, when you get the thought captured, you can't pull the right words together. And so it's, it takes forever. And sometimes I've just walked away without ever having been able to express but oh, when I kneel in prayer, I may not have the words and I may not be able to gather the words, but if I can get before the Lord and I can bring the Psalms of David and I can begin to read them and lay hold to it for myself, it brings me to that place. You see, it dawns on us, and, and this is something we, we inherently struggle with. We struggle with the idea that we are unique. That no person has ever been through what I'm going through. Right. Right. That this particular battle is the first time this has been fought. And nobody's ever gone through what I'm going through. But the truth of the matter is that when you begin to read this, you begin to recognize that David was there, Heman was there, one of the other writers of the Psalms that this person went through the particular things that I'm going through right now, but you see, Satan wants to isolate us. He wants us to feel like that we're men alone, and, and depression and oppression does exactly the same thing because we, be, we, we tend to withdraw, we tend to isolate. So I challenge you and I instruct you, don't search for words that just won't come. Instead, Read the inspired, anointed words of somebody who's already been through it and take it for yourself and let it begin to minister to your spirit because you see, prayer isn't just a one-way communication. It's not just me talking to God. But when I begin to get into that, it's as though the Holy Ghost begins to talk to me and there's this awareness that, look, I'm not fighting this by myself, but I'm there with you. I'm on your side. I've had somebody go through it before you ever came along. Mm -hmm. And their story. And what they went through. The second thing that I've used to great benefit. Is a different kind of prayer as well. This came to be part of my life. And perhaps absolute one of the darkest seasons of life. And I happen to be reading a book. The name of the book is Too Busy Not to Pray. And the author described a particular approach to prayer that was new to me. And I had read about people journaling in prayer for, for decades, I guess. But it just never had really came my interest. But what this fellow presented was just so simple and it was so, uh, it was so easy to take hold of. And, and, of course, I think better in writing. I think clearer when I write things down. And uh, so, so I tackled. And I began to apply it, and I apply it to this day. And there are really five components to the prayer journal approach that I take. First is I sit down, and I have a time of remembrance, and it's a time of reflection. What I want to do is remember what happened yesterday. I want to remember the good. I want to remember the bad. I want to remember the struggle. I want to remember the good things, and I make quickly notes, and I write them down, and it's just a paragraph of remembrance. The real objective of the paragraph of reflection is to get me to stop. 
and to get them to slow down. Because like many of you, my mind is always moving toward tomorrow. I'm always thinking of the next thing. And yesterday's in the past. I can't undo it. I can't fix any of it. I can't repair anything that was broke with it. I can't re-celebrate any of the victories of it in one sense. So let's move on. But in order to effectively do all of this, I've got to get myself stopped. We read that in one of the Psalms earlier. Selah in the Hebrew means pause and consider this. And it shows up over and over in the Psalms. And, and it, it was a musical thought that, that meant we're, we're going to take pause here. We want you to think about what you just sang. We want you to think about what you just read. And so in the Selah moment, I, I, I pause and I, I stop and I reflect. And so my simple little diary, and I do this kind of odd, it starts in the back of whatever prayer journal I'm using, and I put the date, and then I write a single paragraph. The second component is adoration. Third component is confession. The fourth is thanksgiving. Finally, there is supplication. I say them quickly, and now I'll take a little more time with them because I want to flesh it out. Number one, if you're going to do this, you need a journal. The journal doesn't have to be leather bound. My journals early on uh, were just spiral notebooks. It's just empty pages. Uh, sometimes what I use now is a little more elegant than the spiral notebook, but the spiral notebook works just as well as, as what I'm using these days. But when I begin, I go to the back of the journal, write down the date, and then I write that single paragraph. It may be six sentences, it may be seven sentences. I would talk about every little thing that took place. Now I flip to the front of the journal. Again, I put the date in place, and I'm going to begin with adoration. And my adoration is, is done this way. You see, I, I can sit here, and I can say, I adore the Lord Jesus Christ. He is almighty, he is excellent, he is beyond compare, and I can splatter my adoration of him. He is Jehovah Rapha, he is Jehovah Nisi. I can, I can splatter my adoration of him all over the page and really have given no thought to specifically who and what he is. This morning I was, I was reading and uh, the port that I used for my adoration came from the book of Ezekiel and uh, it makes this little statement that the Lord is my inheritance and my possession. And so my paragraph today, and actually I got anointed and it ended up being about a page and a half and I'll preach about it eventually was simply on the fact of having the Lord as my inheritance and as my possession. And that's the only thing I wrote about. That's an incredible thing. That's something to celebrate. That's something to communicate my adoration about. Right now I'm using a book by F.B. Myers and he has taken every chapter of the Bible and he's written a little excerpt uh, about a single verse and so I will read several of those until I find something that resonates for me. I've used books by Charles Rolls. Those were the best that I ever used. <coughs> Dee Campbell Morgan and there are others. Eventually I want to have written my own that kind of follows that pattern. But they give me a topic to celebrate. You get to listening to people praising the Lord a lot of times and it can almost become humorous. Because we praise him without saying anything about him. We just say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. But it should be praise the Lord for God is good because you see, when you read the Psalms, there's something interesting there that is very distinct from the way we Pentecostals tend to praise, and that is the Psalms, which are the 
instruction book of praise are always in complete sentences. It's not just little bits and pieces of hallelujah. We wouldn't be very interested in reading the Psalms if they just said, praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Glory. God's good to me. Whenever we begin to think of the goodness of Jesus, I mean really think of the goodness of Jesus. Think of who he is. Think of what he's done for you. And so I read until something hits me that today I want to celebrate him for this. And I will spend the next five minutes, sometimes longer, in nothing but adoration of Jesus that focuses on that one attribute. That one attribute, that one aspect of the nature of God. I'm telling you, I don't think that in anything I've ever done in my life have I learned about him more than what I have in this particular approach to prayer. Because it focuses me on a particular part of the nature of God. Secondly, see, see us for confession. And of course, when we think of confession, we think about sin. But there's more to confession than sin. There certainly are sins to confess at times. But there are also situations where I need to confess my utter dependence on God. I'm over my head here, Lord. I confess I'm over my head. I need the wisdom of God. And it can be that I confess my own desperate needs to Him. T is when I come with thanksgiving. Depressed people tend to see life only in gray, and it's generally dark gray. Nothing is very good. The sky is falling. Nothing has ever been accomplished in their life. They've never sung a song well enough. They've never written a book that was good enough. They've never had a job and made enough money to support their family that was decent enough. Life just stinks. It's always stuck. It's never been a good time. Well, the truth of the matter is life doesn't really stink. Life doesn't really stink. And there are mountains and there are valleys and there are times of sorrow and there are times of difficulty. But I'm telling you that if I just handed you a piece of paper right now and said I want you to write a half a page, of things that you are specifically thankful for. There would not be one person in this room who does not have way more than half of a page to be thankful for the goodness and the, and the favor of God upon your life. And whenever you begin to be thankful, it begins to lift you out. You begin to recognize, hallelujah, I, I, I know my emotions are all out of whack right now, but... but but, but God's been good to me. Thank you, Jesus. God's been good to me. And it's not always been the way that it is right now. And then S is for supplication. And this last half page paragraph is where I make my appeals to God. And I've been doing this now for almost 20 years. And there are times when I will look back at journals from, from those years ago. And I realize how often that Jesus has answered prayers that I put in that section of supplication. I can remember when our oldest son was in a really bad condition of life. Was dealing with drugs. Was running with the wrong crowd. But somewhere in those journals, it was written day after day, God save, God <coughs> save, God work, God break through, God break through, God break through, God do something, do something. And God did. Hallelujah. What does any of this have to do with when you're struggling with life? It has this. It forces us to thoughtful pray. Too much of our prayers without thought. Jesus was opposed 
to vain repetition. Have you ever listened to a song that we were singing and looked around at the others in the audience and it dawned on you that you and just about everybody else had their mouth moving but their brain wasn't engaged with what was being sung about. That's vain repetition. That's the reason we occasionally need to learn new songs is because that sometimes the old ones can become things that we sing without really thinking about them. Vain repetition is prayer that involves a moving mouth connected to a wandering mind. When you're struggling with life, you need every tool available to cause you to think. And prayer journaling helps with that. There are times later when I built on that, on that particular platform of prayer, and you'll likely do the same thing. Well, Pastor, did it fix it? No. But I had a good talk with the Lord. I knew I had a good talk with the Lord. I knew there was substance to the communication. I got up fighting the same battle that I knelt or that I sat in my chair fighting. And it might continue for weeks and months and sometimes close to a year. And I've been to altars and I have prayed through and spoken in tongues and I felt the power of the Holy Ghost immediately walked back into the clutches of the same despair that was there before. But praying when you don't feel like praying and when you can't configure the sentences to pray is such an important part of you coming out of the darkness and for you having a victory. A single day of prayer isn't likely to fix it, but the sustained aggregate of prayer will help you overcome. So pray when you feel like praying and pray when you don't feel like praying. If you don't adopt what I have taught you tonight as a method for prayer, find some way that you can pray, something that will work for you while you're going through the dark times of your life because there are going to be those times. They're going to come. Tim LaHaye wrote several books. I've got a number of his books. One of his books was on how to overcome depression. And he ended up teaching a seminar on it. He taught it all over North America. Late in his life, LaHay made this observation. He said, I have taught this material to over 100,000 people. He said, in every session for the last while, I have asked the question, is there anybody in this room that has never dealt with what would be called a sustained season of depression? A sustained season of depression lasts more than two weeks, and there's a number of other criteria that go along with it. LaHaye said that in his years of asking that question to over 100,000 people, not one person ever raised their hand that they had not thought that particular way. One student of preaching and ministry said that when I minister on Sunday that one out of four people that I will preach to will be struggling with some degree of depression. That's the reason I'm not going to come here very often. We'll have some saints meetings if we ever need them to straighten out stuff. We all, we all get enough beaten up on in life. We don't need much of that. What we need is encouragement. Yeah. We need strengthening. We need somebody to lift us. We need somebody to declare hope for us. That you can make it. Somebody's been there before you. You can, you can make it. Yeah. You make it. Question. I 
it. Some people don't fight it. I have an acquaintance um, who the question, we'll just leave it running. The question was, why do some people have seasons? Some people seem to stay perpetually. Um, The experience of depression is, is one that is very easy to sit down and quit, to stop the fight. And when you stop the fight, you're, you're in trouble because you're not walking through the valley any longer. You're, you've taken up residence in the valley. And uh, I think that's a major point. There are certainly people who have more of a inclination to depression than, than other people. But the reason I think a lot of people end up just that being what defines their life, and again, I'm thinking of a particular lady, is because that she's just decided she's not a fighter. And so it's one. It's one. And in, in some of the work that I'm doing, um, and I preached this year a while back, uh, the book of Revelation, one chapter, talks about the angels of Lucifer that come and they do attack against the people of God and uh, the Bible says but they will not prevail they attack but they will not prevail well, the way the Greek text puts it it is not that they will not prevail it's that they cannot prevail but the battle goes on anyway there's still the fight um, depression and other things come against us but they won't win if we keep fighting. But now when you put the tie out, when you put up the white flag of surrender, and you quit, it's won. You're, you're done. It's, it's your identity for the rest of your life. Um, you know, there, there are other very practical things that are part of this particular battle. Uh, one is, is that the research says that that uh, having a moderate exercise program will help people who have moderate <coughs> depression as much as being on medication. And a person says, well, I don't want to go work out. What they're saying is I'm not going to fight. What they're saying is, I quit. I'm not going to push back against this thing. And so, other questions. I don't know if that helped or not, but other questions. Get more response on the last couple of weeks of teaching in direct messages than almost any that I've done. Because people are dealing with very real issues of life and listen to me I open with a story of the radio talk show host who belittled and derided the person who was calling in trying to find help you just need to pray through we need to pray but there's some things about this that you can't pray through you have to you have to get a strategy and you have to fight your way through it in every way possible. Any other questions? When you mentioned reading the Psalms out loud and turning so down to the words that I knew this particular situation you were dealing with, maybe you're not over it that day. Do you go back and reread that prayer the next day and the next day until you find yourself being relieved or you find a new song? I find a new psalm. I just keep going and, and, and tend to say it. I've never had to read more than 10 psalms before one hit that this, this is my language. This is my language. This is what, if I could say it, this is what I'd be saying. I don't have words to say it. I can't figure it out. But this this is what I'm really, this is where I'm at. And so the next day, if I've read seven or eight psalms, I'll come back the next day and go to the ninth psalm. I just work my way through from Psalm 1 all the way to Psalm 150. And um, it helps. I, I get as much benefit 
to be honest, from, from being forced in my discipline to, to give consideration to the attributes of God. That's incredible. Um, you, can't, you can't think about how great God is and at the same time be totally sinking in the quicksand. You, you're going to get lifted up a little bit. You may go right back to sinking just as soon as it's passed. But you're